This is the Magic Word Podcast.com. Hello, this is Scott Wells for the Magic Word Podcast.com. Wow, what a weekend this past weekend was. During this past weekend of November the 4th, 5th, and 6th, it was a mega confluence of magic conventions. It was amazing. Okay, you heard here on the Magic Word Podcast the reports from the Trix Convention in North Carolina. We had about 167 people or so, I think, there. But also, the same weekend, was the uh, Daytona Magic had sponsored the uh, Florida uh, State Convention down there. And I think they had over 200 people. And then this weekend in Kentucky was the Unconventional Convention. And I understand they had about 100 people. And I'm not certain how many people were at the Yankee Gathering. Uh, from NEMCA, that is the New England Magic Collector Association, but that's uh, something that happens every other year, and I suspect that they had pretty good registration and attendance at their event as well. So there were four things that were going on here in the U.S. and uh, that were all very well attended and all very different from one another and uh, were, were, were just a lot of fun, just a lot of stuff happening. And I understand the reason that they hosted all those conventions on that weekend is because of the time change. We actually were able to gain an hour by falling back uh, on Sunday, we had set our clocks back an hour, uh, and by doing that, that means got to, to spend a little bit more time, perhaps sessioning, uh, sleep a little bit later, or not have to worry about maybe missing a flight or something because you got to uh, catch up a little bit for about an hour. So a lot of people who were the organizers had decided to have that uh, convention over the weekend. I think that's why we had all four of those. I mean, typically in the U.S., we might have one or two, or two conventions happening the same weekend, but not too often. Do they conflict? Uh, there might be some that overlap. Oftentimes, let's say, like Abbott's get together with Magic Live or something like that. But goodness sakes, for them all to be on the same weekend, a lot of competition there. But still, apparently, enough magicians to go around. Well, I also want to make an appeal to your pocketbooks to see if uh, you can help in any financial way with the Magic Word podcast. Uh, during COVID times, uh, people were. Uh, accumulating. Some people had lost jobs. Some people were, who were working were making money, but for the most part, there was no place to to, to work if you're performing or, uh, or very few places outside of uh, uh, doing Zoom shows. But income was, uh, was lower during that time. And also afterwards, we've had a little bit of recession in which uh, the, our, the stock market has not been kind. I'm saying all that to let you know that the financial pledges that we have been receiving have been reduced rather significantly, uh, as most people's portfolios who have portfolios uh, have been reduced then as well. So uh, anything that uh, you, if you are in a financial position to assist, now would be a good time to help us to make up for some of those pledges that we've lost through patreon.com. So if you go to patreon, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com and look for the magic word podcast, you can find out how that you can support us. Also, if you go to the magic word podcast.com on the website, there is a tab there where you can go to learn how to be a friend of the magic word through your donations. If you just want to make a one-time donation or a, a occasional donation from time to time, that's fine too and uh, greatly appreciated. And when I see people at conventions, it's great. I appreciate when I am given some cash donations uh, face-to-face. That goes directly into uh, the account also to help uh, support this podcast and pay for domain charges and uh, lots of other expenses we have. Anyhow, I start to feel like PBS or NPR just kind of begging for money over here, but uh, I haven't asked for a while. So I thought I would just put in an appeal for your financial assistance through a pledge through patreon.com. It would be greatly helpful. And for those of you who have continued during tough times or good times uh, who have continued with your pledges, I really appreciate that. And for those who do make donations, they're, they're all great. Thank you guys and gals very much for your assistance financially. Uh, again, that helps keep the podcast going far into the future because we got a a lot more people to talk to, <laughs> and and those expenses continue uh, every month. They're always at the door. So thank you guys and gals very much for assisting us financially and with your support. 
This week, we are going to have a long overdue conversation with a longtime friend of mine, and I have tried to have him on a few times in the past to actually have uh, an in-depth conversation like we have here today, but due to his schedule or mine, we just haven't been able to get together, and you can understand why after you hear this conversation as to how busy this gentleman is. And I'm talking, of course, about Dr. Lawrence Haas, or Larry Haas, and Larry is a PhD and philosophy and he and his wife have been living in different parts of the United States, currently residing in Washington, D.C., but along with his friends, Larry has been instrumental in helping to advance the art of magic in the world by creating so many more better magicians. And I say with his friends, I'm including those at the Magic and Mystery School. Yes, he is the dean of the Magic and Mystery School and has been since Eugene's passing back in 2017. So, Larry, along with, of course, Jeff McBride and with Eugene Berger and others on the faculty, have just advanced the art so much. And they are due a lot more credit than they have received, I'm sure. And they have received a lot of credit and recognition in the past. And most everyone in the world is aware of the Magic of Mystery School. And people have traveled from around the world to Las Vegas to attend their various schools because they have different kinds of topics that may range from mentalism to escapes to general magic to stage close-up pretty much you name it they can make you a better performer in this week's episode we kind of run the gamut of uh, talking about a lot of different uh, topics uh, all related uh, certainly to magic but a lot having to do with the magic and mystery school but also about the importance of uh, contracts and uh, lighting things having to do to make your show better this is one of those episodes where hopefully you will learn a lot uh, by just listening to what's being said between the lines as we talk here on this episode. And Larry also gives us ideas on how and where you can go to register for the Magic and Mystery School. And even if you can't get there or your finances are such that you're having some difficulty but still have an avid desire to attend, there can be things that can be worked out. And he talks about that towards the end of this podcast. But there is a lot to unpack here, and this is a little bit longer than our normal conversation that we have. But again, so so much to talk about and so interesting. I call this particular episode Great Answers because throughout this episode, Larry keeps saying, Great question. Great question. Well, <laughs> I appreciate him uh, complimenting me on the question, but his answers are even better. So I think he gives some pretty great answers. So please welcome my guest here this week, Dr. Larry Haas, here on The Magic Word. Today's guest, Larry Haas, Dr. Haas, is someone who many of you have known, may have studied under, have his books. You're familiar with what he has done, and if not, you're going to learn a lot uh, about this uh, intelligent gentleman. As someone I've been wanting to talk with on a one-on-one basis for quite some time, we get to chat from time to time, 10 or 15 minutes now and again. Uh, we have um, so many mutual friends, not the least of whom is the late, great Eugene Berger, and we'll probably get around to talking uh, at length about him then as well. So many topics of conversations. I don't think that this next hour is going to hold it all, but we'll see how much we get packed in here. Please welcome Larry Haas. Hey, Doc, how are you doing? I'm doing great, <laughs> Scott. Thank you so much for having me on. You're welcome. And again, I'm so glad uh, that we happen to see each other and have an opportunity to sit down and chat then for a while. You've been working with uh, Jeff McBride and the Mystery School almost since its inception, pretty much, or yeah. how long? Yes, really. I was brought on as a guest of honor for an experience in 2003. Okay. And I have been part of the program ever since then. So that's 20 years. Yeah, about 20 years. And do you go to Vegas or? I do. I fly to Las Vegas. In the early years, I was flying for a week or two weeks. And then in 2008, I was brought on as a faculty member. So now I was going five or six weeks a year, seven weeks a year. Mm -hmm. And then I became the associate dean. And then when Eugene Berger passed away, I became the dean. So uh, before COVID, I was out there maybe seven or eight weeks during a, any given year to teach classes with mm-hmm. Jeff and Eugene and and do other work on behalf of the school. And uh, 
No, now a bit less in 2022, but we're having more in-person classes out there. So it's we're ramping back up. How does that work as a what I would consider a part-time professional when you have a full-time job and you and your wife, your wife also works at the at the uh, college? Well, it, it's actually a little different. I retired from being a college professor. I retired early in mm-hmm. 2010, so I could go full-time in magic. So I have been a full-time magician since. You know, for 12 years. So my wife, Marjorie, is also an academic, a PhD in philosophy, too. And so I became what's called the trailing spouse. <laughs> she took on positions as college presidents. Yeah. And I went along for the ride and brought the magic business along for the ride. So um, that worked out really well because I can do my work on the road. I can travel to do gigs and go fly to Las Vegas and all as well. Right. So as a trailing spouse, you have moved with her from one place. So you were in Dallas for a while. What was the school Correct. there? Correct. Um, we were in, just north of Dallas, we were in Sherman, Texas, mm-hmm. when she was the president of Austin College in that city for eight years. And mm-hmm. and that was great. We had a lovely time in North Texas. Yeah. I did a lot of work, a lot of shows in um in Dallas, and that was lovely. And now, then we went to Memphis, Tennessee, where my wife became the president of Rhodes College there. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, did all my removed my magic business and everything there. That was well. And now, just for the last year, we now reside in Washington, D.C., mm-hmm. uh, where my wife has taken on a position of a president of a nonprofit. And, of course, there's a great magic community in Washington, so it's great. There really is. Uh, have you gotten in, not just involved with that community, but as I recall, don't they have a uh, – I know that Rich Block has Dickens Theater somewhere up in yes. that neck of the woods, too. I haven't been to Dickens Theater yet. Um, I have been a special guest on the Washington Magic Show, mm-hmm. which is held at the fabulous Arts Club of Washington downtown. Uh, so I, I did a spot there. I've been to Ring 50 – and that's a great, robust uh, ring. Mm-hmm. And um, and now I'm quite a bit on the road again. But yeah, Washington, uh, the magic in Washington, D.C. is really great. When you're on the road again, are you performing magic like for corporate events or are you on the road from the standpoint of teaching? Both, actually. Uh, sometimes I'm performing um, at an event, an organization event, doing a keynote talk with a show mm-hmm. to kind of bring things together. I like to mix magic with... Uh, a few ideas to kind of make everything come together. And often I speak in terms of um, how I, a philosophy professor, became a professional magician. And most people find that topic to be intrinsically interesting. I would think so. Yeah. <laughs> Very much so. <clears throat> but but it's always... And following a similar path to Eugene. Yes, exactly right. That, uh, and, But I... I know it's all about magic first. So the magic is what kind of brings them into the space. And then we pause and talk a little bit. And then there's more magic and more magic and ta- a little talk. So mm-hmm. depending on the audience, I dial the talk up or down. I see. Some audiences want more magic. Great. Some audiences want a little more talking. That's great, too. When I work at a university, they like some of that. So that's a very happy uh, setup for me. Do you work through an agent on your own, or have you gone through NACA to do these kinds of things? Uh, No, no, it's all a personal booking. I do it all personally because over the years, I developed so many contacts in higher education and in connected organizations Mm -hmm. that I honestly— I had enough bookings by doing it that way. I I thought for a while about getting a manager, and it was like, well, it's already lining up so nicely. So Mm -hmm. that has never uh, impressed itself upon me. And business begets business, obviously, too. Exactly. Well, what you say is exactly right. Eugene Berger, our friend, used to say, Larry, always remember, work makes work. (laughs) Exactly. Work must make work. And that is a really good lesson for all magicians. We need to be performing in a way that we end up with additional bookings after we're done. Right. One of the most difficult things, I think, for magicians is to find a venue where they can practice or they can be bad to get good. 
and uh, I think finding fraternal organizations who are needing some free entertainment or something is a good place to go. But by finding that, you start to get better and better, which that some of the business people in those fraternal organizations then will say, I like this person, and I want them to come and work for our company then yes. too. Yeah, you know, that's a, a really wise thing, Scott. I mean, one of the things we talk about with our students at the Magic and Mystery School is make as many shows as you can, yes. especially early on. Flight time. Flight time. Absolutely. You learn what works, what doesn't work. And you also never know when the person in the audience is going to book you. For example, uh, I did a rotary event in Dallas totally unpaid, didn't matter. Right. I was in front of 50 high-flying Dallas business people, and out of that, I got a call and an invitation to headline a TEDx event at uh, SMU. Wow. And there we go. And completely that, unexpected. Totally. Um, sure. Completely <laughs> unexpected and an unbelievable opportunity that has ended up being a very powerful calling card. Yeah, because you now have that TEDx that's going to be living in digital cyberspace in perpetuity, which you can point to and say, well, I've done this. And they say, you have? Yeah. yeah so. And I patterned my TEDx talk uh, to be similar to the kind of thing people might experience when they hired me. Mm -hmm. And uh, so now there's they have some kind of a version of what they see, magic and talking, all of it designed to help people experience the joy of magical astonishment. Had that not happened, that yeah. confluence of events, how would one go about doing a TEDx or TED Talk? Yes, it's a good question. Uh, in the early days of TED... It wasn't the phenomenon it is now. It really is kind of like YouTube. I mean, it wasn't the beginning. Exactly. Everything has a beginning. So what I would recommend is that people get connected with a, a local TEDx event. That's mm. what TEDx's are, is they're connected to local organizations mm. in many cities all over the world. And often that would be a good way to get your foot in the door. But... It used to be easier. Now people have figured out TEDx is the way into TED, and so that people might have to audition. Mm -hmm. And I, I can say something of value for your, our listeners here. When you do an audition, when you create an audition, say, video of the talk you would do, mm -hmm. you want it to be the talk you would do as completely and professionally as you can make it. Because what TED organize, TEDx organizers are going to look for is a highly polished, fully accomplished talk that they see it and they go, that's it, I want it on my program. Mm -hmm. Rather than something that's kind of rough around the edges, they don't need rough around the edges. They're looking for... A Polish. fully polished professional job. So if they can see you online, why would they hire you then later? Ah. Because they could just tell their employees, watch this video, here's an email with the link. Good, good point. What I always tell my people when I send them to the TEDx talk is this is a specific presentation that I did to meet their requests, oh. but I tailor every presentation I do Customized. for your group right. and your needs and um, I, what I do when I'm negotiating an event is I say that we're going to collaborate together on creating the event that your people need. So let's talk. Mm -hmm. And so now it's not something in the can that they get to see. Everything I do has been crafted for those people. And truly, I do that mm -hmm. uh, because then I'm delivering exactly what that audience needs to have a strong experience. Wow. And so how much time would you say that it takes for you to put that together? Good question. I'm cultivating a, a variety of customers or clients at any given time. Mm -hmm. Sometimes these conversations take a little while. There are some people who just want to book me. They've seen me and they're like, we yes, want I want you to do this. Great. Mm -hmm. Even then, I'm still going to get in the conversation mode with them so I can learn a lot about what they need, what kind of presentation they need. Uh, who their people are, how much alcohol will be in the room, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. that will determine what I perform sure. and what I present. But uh, sometimes people want to have a longer conversation, and we really get into a kind of partnership. So I'm partnering with the booker. At every step, it's about my delivering the kind of event their people need. So that, I think, has 
it's a little time consuming and some sure. clients take more time, but the payoff of this is remarkable because the experience then has been crafted. Exa- I'm not just phoning in one particular mm-hmm. show for everybody. I'm crafting something that people feel is very connective. And, so, and often the content, the things I talk about is directed exactly to these people because I also do my research. So Right. Well, that was kind of a leading question because I do the same thing, obviously, when I'm working with trade shows. Yeah. No two trade shows are like, even if I'm working for the same company in the same year or following year or whatever, because they might have new products or new services that they're offering that they want to highlight for their clients and potential clients to know. And you spend a lot of time trying to, first of all, understand what they want, who they are, and then and then later trying to fit the tricks into the presentation because just like with, I would imagine, the conversations or the talks that you give, the the talk is more important than the magic. And the same thing here, trying to sell the product and the company is more important than the magic. The magic is a vehicle. Correct. Uh, that uh, That is the leading question because you you said it maybe even better than me because <laughs> that's, exactly, <laughs> that's exactly the process. And it's when you're making presentations in a corporate context – this is a strong model, the one that we've both been talking about. Mm-hmm. Do you teach that kind of thing at the uh, at the mystery school? We do. At the Magic and Mystery School, people come to be with us, and they have all kinds of questions. They have questions about their magic and how to make it better. They have mm-hmm. questions about this, that, and the other thing. But always at one of our master classes, we are talking about the business of magic because many, not all, but many of our uh, students or participants – they want to make money at this, either full-time professional or semi-professional. And Jeff and I and Tobias Beckwith, uh, we have negotiated a lot of agreements over the years. Mm-hmm. And there are tricks and tips. There are uh, things we've learned in the process of this that uh, younger developing magicians just haven't learned yet. I just had a conversation with someone recently uh, about this, Larry, about um – contracts and end times because that took some time for me to understand and to tweak my contract to have an end time because they're uh, many times they'll take advantage of the performer and they say hey we're running a little bit late hope you don't mind and you might have another engagement you got a plane to catch or whatever it happens to be and if it runs beyond a certain end time i say okay well i'm going to start charging in these 15 minute increments of this price so this way keep me on time or it's going to cost you if it's costing me it's going to, i'm going to pass this on to you basically that's just a small thing so i'm sure that through experience you learn these kinds of things and those are taught there at the, at the school absolutely that's a and that's a great one end times are really good i think i would just uh back up even just a little bit and say having an agreement is good. You, you, <laughs> Everybody should have an agreement. I don't care if you're doing birthday parties, have an agreement. Yeah. The, it's just, professional. It's the way to do it. It is the way to do it. And so many people, I've heard so many horror stories of people who didn't have the agreement. Mm. And maybe they showed up at the event and they didn't have what they needed. And now they're having a really bad night. Or, or they got burned one way or another uh, because a client dropped them at the last minute. So... Uh, th- there are, you know, there are shows you do for friends and family and uh, close acquaintances, and you don't need an agreement there. But for anything else, I get it in writing. I had a horror story once in which I'll share that I was uh, given, uh, signed the contract, they gave me an address. I was there an hour and a half early, starting to get my things set up. No one was showing up. And I asked, you know, about a half hour before, well, isn't this the right place? And I said, we don't know what you're talking about. So I made a call to this uh, person. They weren't answering their phone. Finally, they called me at the time that the thing was supposed to begin. And they said, well, we're around the corner and we're like five miles away, basically. Uh, and so you're going to have to t- So, well, the contract said here, the point is the, her boss, who was the president of the company was a little bit upset that I, number one was late. Uh, and number two, didn't want to pay the full fee since I wasn't there the full time. I, and I had the contract with me and showed him and said, here's the address where I was on time. And this lady had signed this. I'm not trying to make her look bad or anybody. I'm just saying I was doing the right thing contractually that helped me. And he said, okay, I understand. And he was fine with that then. That's a great story because now you were off the hook because you had that piece of paper. Without that, you would have looked unprofessional. Correct. Yeah. One one thing you might – over the years, you learn different things that you need to get in your agreements. And 
Depending on the size of the event, I mean, I work from, you know, 10 people in a private party in a house to hundreds of people in a ballroom. Mm -hmm. Uh, At some point, it's important, I think, for performers to understand their technical requirements. You get to a certain size and a microphone is required. Yes. Not optional. Yep. You get to a certain size and extra lighting is required, not prob- not, not preferred. You get to a certain level where you need to be, need to be up on a platform. And th- many times so uh, developing magicians who don't have much experience in this area, they end up and they don't have the basic equipment they need to be successful. And it's going to it's going to look bad on them. It'll reflect back on them. Exactly. So be thoughtful about your technical needs and don't be shy in asking for them because my experience is most organizations will happily supply them. And you can get more money for that if you say, look, I can supply my own because sometimes these companies will say, I'll do that. They check with the hotel and they find out what an astronomical price that the hotels will add on and add on. And so, uh, but you can always say, or I can provide my own at this price and then say, let them get back to you. And they'll say, yeah, I think we'll go with you after they've checked the other price, Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, that's that's great. I bought a PA system for one Mm -hmm. high flying gig uh, that more than paid for the PA system by many thousands of dollars. Mm -hmm. And then... uh, and then I got able it to, to offer the very thing that you just said. Right, right. And it's something you're comfortable with, works for you. You know when you plug it in, it's going to uh, uh, meet your requirements, basically, uh, and something that everyone's going to be able to hear and whatnot. So uh, it's that's very important that you get the right technical equipment. Very important. It, you know, we just learn by doing and making every mistake, right? I mean— Unfortunately, I, but true. <laughs> I learned from every single show, and the idea about lighting uh, was impressed upon me. I was doing a show many years ago, and it was in a hotel room, and it only had canned lights in the ceiling. Mm-hmm. And if you haven't experienced this yet, trying to perform under canned lights in the ceiling— makes you look like you have spots on you and they can't see your face and they can't see the props so after that show that night i said eugene's famous saying that will never happen to me again and it hasn't Mm -hmm. years ago walter blaney had given me plans to his blaney lights that are three different uh spotlights basically of uh red blue and um yellow that are floodlights basically but it's in a little box and on rollers or casters and you roll the thing in you break it apart and when you do then there are are two sets of three basically so you Mm -hmm. have them on the floor so they're uh, floor light lit so it's shining up at you that could be a very harsh light if you don't have the overhead lights if you just have that then you get the reverse kind of shadows kind of coming up as opposed to coming down but if it mixes with what you've already had that's not perfect in every situation but uh it was something handy to to have so as you will understand when we are, say, working in a local environment within a state, oh, we can put these things in the back of our cars, Easily. and then we have, and I always do. I always yeah. have more than I need. Mm-hmm. Uh, but when we're flying now, that technical rider needs to be a little more rigorously worked out with the people who are there. And I try to build in plenty of time to be there uh, and get into the event and do the tech so that I'm never up against the start of the show. I never want that experience. I want everything to be set before a single person walks into the ballroom. Sure. Do you do much walk around, strolling, cocktail hour kind of stuff? I have over the years, and sometimes I do that as an add-on. Mm-hmm. Um, not as much as I used to. I really earned, you know, kind of broke my teeth, uh, my eye teeth in magic by doing a lot of walk around. And mm-hmm. I still sometimes do it and love it. Uh, the reason I ask that is because you say it, make sure to bring more than what you need. And oftentimes, well, I've learned a long time ago, if you're going to be doing some close-up, I used to bring like a whole magic shop with me basically in all my pockets. You don't need to because you're going to be walking around, obviously, and you learn pretty quickly to get skinnier and skinnier and narrow it down because people are not going to be watching what the other group is doing necessarily, so you can repeat a lot of things. On the other hand, it's important, I think, to bring some things because quite often, as you know, in which they may say, hey, do you mind doing about 30 minutes for the group? Or can everybody kind of gather around and before long you've got a larger group and you need to have some stand-up material? Absolutely. And in effect, I like to try to engineer the very thing you said. Oh, you do. I try to engineer it because uh, so I'll walk around for small groups Mm -hmm. and as you say, now I'm not going to be really heavily loaded in my pocket anymore i've learned 
I can entertain more people in smaller groups with fewer things. And, uh, and then I also might say in about 10 minutes, I'm going to be right over there working for the whole group. Mm -hmm. And now I've built a kind of excitement about this. And I've said that very thing for several of the groups. And so if the situation is right, then in about 10 or 15 minutes, I'll stand on a chair or the host will stand on a chair or clink a glass Mm -hmm. and pull everyone to attention. And now I can work for the whole group with other material for a 10 or 15 minute stand-up show. It's really nice to do that. Yeah. And so you intentionally bring some things for that thinking I'm going to lead people into... I'll I'll try to lead them there because I can give them a different kind of experience. You've touched on something very important there because so often when you do an act, others will see you and they will book that same act. And then you say, well, I also offer this. Well, I didn't know you did that too. But if you're doing close-up and then a stand-up show, they're going to say, oh, he does both. Yes, yes, exactly. As magicians, we know all of these kinds of performance styles we do, but non-magicians have zero idea. Sure. They don't even, you know, they don't know about walk around. They don't even know what that word means. Yeah, they don't even know what close up means. Yeah. And so we're constantly educating our non-magician clients Mm -hmm. in what's possible for them. And I have personally found if I explain those things clearly, they get really excited by it Mm -hmm. and they're interested to see what that might look like for them. Yeah, uh, very true. Uh, so these are the kinds of things that are taught then in at mystery school. Absolutely. But I also know over the years, Jeff has grown the school such that it's not just that, but he has mentalism school and I don't know what other kinds yes. of stuff he has. Well, it's really something. Uh, the Magic and Mystery School is almost having its 35th anniversary. Oh, We're my just goodness. a year or two wow. away from that. Mm-hmm. And it's worth thinking about how... Uh, you know how how rare it is for something in magic to be to last that long, mm-hmm. and the mystery school has really been an institution. So, when it started out, they were creating kind of experiential retreats, but at some point, it became a school school, and we offered and still do master classes, which are designed to help. Uh, It's personal performance direction, you know, personal performance feedback. People perform and we give them direction to help them improve. We still do that, but we have other classes on focus areas like mentalism, like real world close up magic, uh, business for magicians. And we have uh, many subject areas. And you'll find this interesting, Scott. As the pandemic set in, we moved the whole operation online for Mm -hmm. 2020. And it worked really well. Hmm. We had been using Zoom technology for our program for the previous four years. So when the pandemic hit, we already understood the technology. You didn't need to flip. You already had it. We were so busy during the pandemic because we just did online classes uh, throughout the whole time. And we started back with in-person classes last fall. Wow. Now, how many people will be... In the a master class, I assume that those are limited uh, to a certain like the, dozen or something. They are because uh, almost all of the participants are performing and getting feedback, and that's mm. that's a process. Sure. We just completed one in Las Vegas where we had eighteen participants for seven days. Okay, so a long program. We also do shorter master classes for like a Friday, Saturday, and a Sunday, and we won't we won't. We will maybe limit that to 15 uh, participants, but not everyone will perform for feedback. And I'm assuming that in a master class, then, are most people already, as you say, are professionals. They come in with an act, or they may ha- send in a video beforehand saying, I would like to have some feedback and some tweaking of my blocking or whatever. Absolutely. Uh, we don't really audition people. Uh, we tend to you know, communicate with them and learn what they're interested in. And uh, we, what we'll find with our master classes is we will have people who are in magic not very long who will have worked something up, and they'll perform it, mm. and we can help them level up. Yeah. And then we'll have a full-time pro come in and show us their piece, and we can help them level up. So we take every magician at the level they are, mm-hmm. and we try to help move the needle And the thing I would say about moving the needle, we're really, really what we're trying to do is help each magician do better at the kind of magic 
they want to do. It's never about becoming us. It's always about helping them understand their vision and going for it. That's a good point. There are so many clones. And I imagine early on, and maybe even still today, that Jeff has people come in wanting to do a mask act. You know, I like you, and I've been studying your DVDs, or I've been watching your YouTube, and they come in, they send them maybe a tape of of uh, somebody doing Jim McBride instead of Jeff yeah. McBride, basically. And I'm sure Jeff says, let's be yourself. Let's figure out who you are, I assume. Absolutely. I mean, you know, Eugene's, Eugene Berger's question, it, which I'll, ask, I'll mention in a minute, he said this at every master class, and that was, what do you want your magic to be? Hmm. It can be anything, but it needs to be you. And really, our work is to help each magician understand themselves better, being the magician that they naturally are. Um, as you say, sometimes people come in and they're copying someone. David sure. Copperfield was really popular <laughs> there for a while. Yeah. Um, and Jeff, of course, and Max Maven. And Lance's. Uh, and Lance. Uh, dove actor. But we find ways to gently encourage people to let go of some of the things that aren't true to them and to hang on to the things that are true to them and that are most interesting for audiences to see. Do you find it's easier or more difficult with an older person who's an old dog, it's hard to learn new tricks, as opposed to a younger person that might be more malleable? Or if some people come to you, it's kind of like, okay, I am ready to give in and give up and have someone, regardless of age. Yeah, that's a great question. I think young people are more malleable. Okay. They are uh, filled with possibilities, mm. thinking about possibilities, just in virtue of being uh, twenty some teenagers or 20-somethings. Mm-hmm. And so they're not quite as locked in as someone who's maybe been doing a particular thing a particular way for a long time. So where this really comes to play, Scott, I would say, is if someone has been doing a, a particular routine, let's say like a cut and restored rope routine, they've been doing it a certain way for 25 years. Mm-hmm. But that doesn't mean it's necessarily the best uh, routine for whatever reason. It's sometimes hard for people to take something they've been doing so long and make it better because they've got a habit or a lock. Right. And we try to help, and some people do achieve that, but they have to work a little harder. What about stock lines? Do you work with people as far as scripting and saying, okay, don't say your other hand or trap door and all these things? Yes, we want to help. So there's a place for, you know, all kinds of humor and magic, and Mm -hmm. we help comedy magicians achieve that. But we also find those places where people are using stock lines, hack lines, things that aren't really true to their character. They saw someone do it, say it at a magic club or at a magic event, but it's not true to their character. Mm-hmm. And when that happens, we I just did this with a, Jeff and I each did this with a student recently. It was, that's a funny line, but it's not your line. That mm-hmm. Your character wouldn't say that line to an audience member. You've just kind of uh, lost the moment. And they agreed. They're like, you're totally right. I needed your help to see that. That's what I was about to ask. You have to have those times in which some people are pretty adamant. It's like they will give excuses as to, and, and from their mind, legitimate excuses as to how they develop that and why they do and say that. And you're saying, yeah, but from an outside objective uh, viewpoint, that's not you. That's not what you should be doing. And they continue to do that. I mean, that's their choice. They can walk back having essentially learned nothing other than just feeling like they wasted their money, but they really need to be paying attention, shouldn't they? Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. You know, one thing I think that would be useful to mention is uh, we never present ourselves as the authorities. We are experienced performers, all of us, who've learned a lot, and we've done a lot of teaching and working with students over the years. So we have experience. We don't have the answers, but we do have an experienced eye. Sound like a therapist, almost. Uh, it, well, that's really true. <laughs> you know, we're sometimes a therapist for someone's magic act. Yeah. Or, but we're also big cheerleaders. Mm. You know, so some, so it's we say this all the time. We're not the expert on your act, but we can give you feedback so you can consider what decisions you want to make. Mm-hmm. And that's the way we present it. You're the artist. You make the decision. But here's what I'm seeing. What do you think? And that kind of approach helps people. You know, we're not dogmatic. We're not like that. Mm-hmm. Do this, do that. I mean, that's that's right. not education. So um, 
people really respond to this collaborative model of learning. And saying, what do you think you should be doing? And yeah. maybe here's a suggestion. What do you think if you try this? Just try it for, for a moment. See if that works for you. I, it's all feels I, natural. I, I think of magic as kind of like empirical science. Very often hmm. someone will say, Larry, should I do this or do that? And I say, I don't know the answer. Try them both. Try them both. Yeah. See what your audience tells you is better for you. Because if you listen to the audience, you will very quickly see which feels better for you. I have that issue also when I'm at conventions like this for dinner. Chicken or fish? I'll take both. Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> I'll decide after I've sampled the both. <laughs> yeah, it, so much of it is about learning through performance. And so we can help people and make suggestions and give them fresh ideas, which we do a lot. We're, we're idea people, mm -hmm. but really our participants, our students, they have to take it out and see what really helps them succeed. Well, we're talking about flight time. They got to run it up and fly it. That's one of the big things about the master class because – uh, people often feel very nervous to perform in front of Jeff McBride, especially, of mm -hmm. course, a great superstar. Sure. Um, and if they do that, they have done something that's amazing. Mm. But performing at the House of Mystery in Las Vegas is a very safe place. Mm -hmm. Mistakes that happen there, they're not happening on a big stage at Apple. I mean, they're happening in a safe space with very constructive, supportive teachers and a community that's there to help. So the real experience is that, you know, n no one gets destroyed at our school. That just doesn't happen. We're not that kind of thing. You're not uh, about tearing down someone's no. act, obviously. Mm -hmm. No, it's so hard to do this. Magic is so hard to do. It is art. I think when you look at that, ultimately, everyone has a different... I mean, I, I have judged several contests close up and stage, uh, and... I have a critical eye just based on my comparison of uh, my experiences, just as uh, you do in having seen other students and, as we both know, a lot of magic, and trying to put all those into context and focusing on this particular act or this particular thing. The same thing with a painting. When you look at something, I may not like that because I don't like red. And, yes. and you may say, oh, that's the most beautiful red painting I've ever seen. Yes. Yeah, very, it, it, just to give you an example, very often my, my, the way I respond to a student says, is, could I do this routine? My response is a question. Who do you perform for? You know, what venues are you performing in? Mm. You know, because I can't answer that question in a vacuum. I need to know where they perform, uh, who the p clients are that they perform for. And mm. now I have a little more to be able to advise them. And you'll understand this instantly, Scott. I might say, oh, you know what? That trick isn't big enough for 500 people. True. The people in the back aren't going to be able to see that particular <laughs> one. But I've learned that the hard way. Me too, right? But this other thing over here would be better for you because now people in the back can see it. So we it's about learning what their own vision is. Mm -hmm. That is Eugene's question. What do you want your magic to be? And hearing what they tell me helps me advise them better. Yeah, that's a very good point because they may see themselves performing in a nightclub that's going to have some pounding music in the background or maybe some people who are disinterested or it could be again like whether you might be performing in a trade show or whether that you're performing in a seance and uh or, or people and where people are focused in on listening to everything that you say where you have to have a good story and everything that you're telling or it could be all the different kinds of venues around whether it's the magic castle or the uh uh, Chicago Magic Land, wherever. I mean, wherever. yeah, you know, a corporate show for a banquet or whatever. So, yeah, you kind of have to have an idea. Is your audience going to be wearing jeans or are they going to be wearing tuxedos? Yes. You know? And I, and I want to return to, uh, to build on that, I want to return to something I'd mentioned earlier. Jeff McBride, I'll never forget this. This was many years ago at one of our master classes. We're sitting in our circle and and Jeff said, it's important to understand there's a difference between thinking audiences and drinking audiences. Mm. Thinking audiences are there to remember. Drinking audiences are there to forget. Wow. Yeah. Wow. It changed you my life. You my world there. I haven't ever heard that before. It's an amazing concept. Huh. Jeff is full of them. And I sat there, and it totally changed the way I build shows and how I think about uh, performing, because... 
one of my primary questions when I'm being booked is for me to understand, is this a drinking audience or a thinking audience? Because, as you will understand, to do a thinking show for a drinking crowd is a bad night. Mm -hmm. This opposite is true, too. Mm -hmm. To do a drinking show for a thinking crowd is for you to have failed, to miss the mark. Mm -hmm. So this is Jeff's big idea is a really important thing to help us build better shows for our particular audiences. And the venue is is the thing, too. Are there a lot of flashing blue and red lights? Just recently, a quick example, I had a, a, a person at our master class ask if color uh, uh, coins... Uh, uh, copper-silver transposition routine would be great. And I said, where will you be doing it? Uh, in a nightclub. And the answer there is not so good because with colored lights on, those coins look the same color. Like bottle top. <laughs> They're not going to see that you're changing a silver coin to a copper one or a brass one. And so as soon as I said it, he's like, oh, that's not the right one. And so then we worked on helping him find something. It should be like a washer to a poker chip or something that's much more visual than that kind of lighting. Absolutely right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Speaking about focusing in on that, uh, when I, I performed for a Mensa group one time, and I knew they were going to be focused. They were not a drinking group. They're Thinking. A, highly thinking group and they wanted an all mentalism show oh yeah yeah so i'm thinking i don't know and i and i did and afterwards like that was great i got great uh, testimonials from them it's i sweated that one out yeah but because i thought i've never had i mean i've also performed for a nasa scientist uh, down in houston or actually down in galveston many years ago and i got some great testimonials from them too because you just got to know who your audience is absolutely i that's a great example uh, doing a drinking show for mensa you would have been a, it would have been totally bad for everyone, <laughs> exactly. right? Exactly. Yeah. So, just to return to that, I uh, find a way to figure out how much drinking is in the room uh, in my early conference uh, conversation calls about it. So, one thing I might say, and will there be a cocktail reception? Mm -hmm. And what time will that start? And if the cocktails start at five and I'm not on till nine, drinking. <laughs> On the other hand, oh, no, I mean, people can get drinks at the theater bar or whatever, but that's not what this is about. And now I know thinking and you kind of feel or uni at every university it's thinking. So you kind of this is a, a major a major point of orienting my show building. And so when you are doing for a, a drinking crowd, are you trying to do more visual magic and trying to be faster since they can't? hold attention long? Good question. Uh, I, that's an excellent question. I would say what it's about for me is using less words. Hmm. So I can uh, dial down the amount of words in my presentation <laughs> or dial them up. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, a thinking audience likes big ideas along with their visual magic. Sure. A drinking audience doesn't want big ideas or even small ideas. They want to just be entertained. So the music will come on then. Mm -hmm. And I might say a few things, but I'm not going to develop the concept perhaps with that piece. So it's often the same piece. So it, both things are true, Scott. It's often I'll do the same piece with a different presentation. But I also have some pieces I just don't do for a drinking audience or some pieces I do for a drinking audience that I don't do for a thinking audience. I'm going to throw you a curveball. What about weddings? <sighs> yeah. So I have done a lot of engagement parties, which yeah. is a different creature than a wedding. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I have done a wedding. My, uh, I've d and I've done some like golden and silver anniversaries as well. Mm -hmm. What I try to do... What I try to do, what I most have to do with those big anniversary events where romance is in the air and a couple is being celebrated, what I most have to do is honor the couple. Yes. Not do 75 minutes. No one wants me to do 75 right. minutes at a wedding. Mm -hmm. Because that's... <laughs> that's not the focus of the wedding. No, they might think that's what they want, but mm -hmm. they don't really want it. And so what I tend to do in this circumstance is I build the event so that... We're going to have 10 minutes at a, at a kind of perfect time in the evening to celebrate the couple mm -hmm. before the music starts in the background right, or whatever. Right. So what I'm often doing is helping with event planning so that my magic has a better chance of succeeding. 
So you talk with the event planner. That's uh, yeah, a good idea. I do. Okay. Oh, I, and sometimes it's like the in that one wedding I did, it was kind of the parents of the bride or whatever. But sometimes it's the couples in a silver. They don't understand that. Look, we're just gonna, we're just gonna. You both are going to join me on stage. We'll put all the lights on us. Right. You give me ten minutes, and you, I will be sp- spotlighting you for that ten minutes. Well, those anniversaries Larry, are a lot like birthday parties for adults, whether they're 50, 60, 70, 80th birthday party kind of a thing, as opposed to going back to, uh, specifically to weddings. Weddings are huge over in the U.K., mm-hmm. whereas over here, working restaurants is a huge thing. Yeah. Vice versa, they're not over there. But uh, they do work a lot of uh, venues and castles and whatnot over there. And so I have tried my darndest to do a lot of weddings over here, and I've gone to wedding shows and trade shows to uh, try to sell myself and I've done about a dozen of them but mm-hmm. I mean in context of everything else really it's not many but I've done probably more than most and I uh, it is kind of difficult that's why I was asking if you had done some of those because there are children there is some drinking there are some older people so there's some non-drinkers as well as drinkers a little bit during cocktail yes. and so also the focus of the wedding is on the bride and groom specifically the bride and so it's difficult for them to hire someone who they think will take the focus off of their dress and everything, you know. Yes, exactly. And I'm just a kind of a, I'm a sideline to their event. Yeah. I'm not a main event. And and it's so it's tricky. And what, I would, what I've done at the Silvers and Goldens that I've done is I've had that 10-minute spotlight where I take the stage and I make something very romantic and special for yeah. the couple. But then I will... I will walk around and do some table magic while people are sitting at rounds. Yeah. So I'll give them little bits of that. They will get me, mm-hmm. but it's again, it's not about my doing a big, big show because that's not why they're there for. Right, right. Changing the subject entirely, yeah. but going back to the beginning, we talked about Eugene Berger throughout our chat here. And when did you first meet Eugene, by the way? So Eugene and I met in the summer of 1994. Okay. And... Uh, I had just fallen in love with magic. I didn't really do magic as a kid. I did magic as a philosopher. I was a young philosophy professor, and I discovered magic, and I became interested in magic philosophically. What is this art, and why is it so great? And uh, we were spending summers in Chicago, and someone said, you need to go see Eugene. He's performing down at Biggs. Mm -hmm. And I took my family. We went down to Biggs. Eugene did a 20-minute set at our table, and it was fabulous. And he and I, afterwards, we just struck up a friendship because he had been at the University of Illinois, mm-hmm. and my wife and I were both, f- had been at the University of Illinois. Was that where he was teaching, well, yeah. theology? and Yeah, yeah. he was doing comparative religion. He was a philosophy student there doing comparative religion about uh, 15 years before my wife and I were there. So mm-hmm. we knew some of the same characters. I see. And that was just the start of a beautiful friendship. We followed it up with letters and calls, and we got together. And I was a young magician, but a very serious one. And, of course, Eugene was a wise magician. But we talked about philosophy. We talked about life. We talked about Chicago because my wife is from that city. So our friendship had magic, but it started on all these other terrains. And as I became more experienced and more skilled, uh, Eugene and I started performing together and lecturing together. And Mm -hmm. uh, I brought him to my college programs and he got me connected to the mystery school. And so, you know, he was one of my very best friends in the whole wide world uh, on every front, magic, life, and philosophy. It's just I can hear the the canter of your voice is so much like him. If I close my eyes and I could hear your voice as you will age, that it will become a little bit more deeper and you have that same pacing. I'm a baritone and he was a bass and he'd be down here, Larry. <laughs> and I can do Eugene like there's no tomorrow because, uh, you know, he had one of those great voices in magic, didn't he? Well, which goes to the point of the story I would like for us to uh, share. <laughs> And that is when you and I sat down and your wife uh, at breakfast one morning, and I asked him if he would be the Grinch. We'll talk about the Grinch. I distinctly remember. I was (laughs) thinking about that earlier. 
Uh, do you tell the story from your point of view with his voice? Well, it was quite amazing because Scott asked Eugene if he would narrate The Grinch That Stole Christmas, How the Grinch Stole Christmas. And Eugene had never read this book. Eugene didn't watch TV, you must understand. He had never read this book. He had never heard Boris Karloff narrate it from the TV special. And he narrated it with his deep voice, and he was pretty incredible. He was. But he was, who is this Grinch person? <laughs> yeah, 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 who is this Grinch person? But he did it. And that without even really studying through it or rehearsing it, he just did it. And First it take. was quite good. <laughs> it was quite good. I, I mentioned that because that was one of my favorite episodes that I spent so much time, and I've had so few downloads, unfortunately, of that particular oh. one. It was uh, during the holidays. And... I, it was one of those things in which I had a lot of other people play the parts, the, who magicians I had talked with throughout the year saying, hey, would you read this? But then I had uh, Jean read as the Grinch. The follow-up to that was funny uh, because I came out in December several years ago. And in January, I got an email then from Paul Daniels. Have I told you this story or followed no. up with this? Okay. So Paul Daniels sent me an email saying, I just was sitting here at breakfast uh, with uh, Debbie, and we were so enjoying the episode with our, our mutual friend, uh, Eugene Berger. It was so much fun. Thank you very much for, for posting that episode. It was great. So I wrote back, and I said, so glad you liked it. Thanks for listening. Would you be interested perhaps in being on the podcast yourself? And he wrote back, said, be delighted to, you know, whatever time. And we we arranged for a time. We talked for over two hours. I ended up making that into two different episodes, but it was all because of our mutual friendship, because that whole thing came together. That's wonderful. Paul <laughs> is delightful. That was delightful. Was. That was great. Yep, he was. So Eugene, as uh, you and Gene and I struck up our friendship that summer, and we became close friends and then colleagues and then show partners and everything else. Uh, and through the mystery school, and you know, you might have been thinking of this. I, of course, was so honored in 2010 when Eugene asked me to take on the task of writing and publishing two books of his materials yeah. after he left this earth. Mm -hmm. And um, knowing he was not going to be able to see the publication complete. That was one of the conditions. He's like, Larry, I don't want these to be published while I'm alive because people mm -hmm. are still paying me to perform this material. See. So mm -hmm. he wanted it secret. Uh, and the other thing is he didn't want me to tell anybody about it. And that Even was, that you were working on the project? No, oh, no one, no one. He, it, was a, it was an absolute condition. I could tell my wife, yeah. Margie, who is a, also a dear friend of Eugene's, but we couldn't talk about it with anyone, and not Jeff McBride, not, wow. not Max Maven, Nobody. zero. Hmm. And I asked why, and he said, because, Larry, I don't want to have to talk about this for the rest of my life. He hmm. said... He said, imagine people coming up to me at a magic convention going, so when are we going to get those books exactly. of yours? Which is, in effect, when are you going to be gone? <laughs> yeah. And like like Eric Mead's hearing about Tim Conover book all the time. He's tired of ta talking about when that's going to come out. That's exactly what Eugene didn't want to face. Uh -huh. So I kept that promise. Was he facing his impending death at that no he was not okay. in at that in early 2010 when he asked me to take this on he had just gotten out of the hospital for a heart I arrhythmia that. i think he was in houston for that oh yeah he could well have been mm -hmm. uh, and that reminded him that he didn't have an infinity of time mm -hmm. and it so the inspiration was not in front of him the inspiration was behind him i don't want these great routines lost mm -hmm. i want them to be gotten in the hands of magicians and told by me exactly Rather overseen than, by me yeah. you know and so we started working on the books immediately and i had so many backups and notes and videos and everything and he was approving copy i'll tell you a story about that in a moment he was approving copy and everything was going swimming and then in the summer of 2017 he very suddenly unbeknownst to him unbeknownst to all of us he was diagnosed with cancer and in just a couple of months, he was gone. Wasn't that pancreatic? No, he it, it uh, apparently started in his lung, hmm. but by the time it had been diagnosed, it had metastasized okay. into his spine and his hip and so on. Okay. So that's how it, it went very quickly. He did not know. Hmm. And so then, boy, now the project has to really be gotten out there because these are his unpublished secrets. And the the story about that that I wanted to tell you, and I don't think I've said this to anybody publicly, uh, 
I had done all that writing with him prior to it. Sure. But everything was changed now because he was gone. I had I, huh. I had not been able to really write him in the past tense while he was alive. I couldn't do that. And I had written it while well, I'd written so many of these chapters while he was alive, and they didn't have the right tone for after he was gone. Because I knew everybody would be reading this from the perspective of mourning Eugene. Mm-hmm. So I basically rewrote everything just to get the tone right and the voice right and the past tense right. And wow. and so the book really were, was shaped in that way after he was gone, both of them. So rather than saying, this is the way I do it, you say, this is the way he did it. Absolutely. My, so it's written in third person or is it written in first person? Um, so it's written in the first person of me hmm. uh, who spent – countless hours and years with Eugene learning these materials for this purpose. Okay. However, I carried out many, many interviews with Eugene to learn everything, and often I would put an interview with Eugene about a particular routine in the book so they could read Eugene's own words about it. Mm -hmm. So it's not so much first person like Larry, Larry, Larry. It is Eugene said, Eugene told me, Eugene said... Mm -hmm. Eugene always did it this way. Here's why. And so they're pretty well documented in terms of real conversations. must have been quite emotional for you to actually go back and flip that switch because you were writing it in present tense, knowing it's going to be in the future. But then you kind of looked at it and said, this is not the way it should be remembered. And you had to rewrite that and then think, oh, boy. You're right on the button. It was he was gone and I was missing him, of course. But I knew the readers would be missing him, too. So I couldn't be just like, well, I don't know, pretending he was still here because he wasn't. Yes. Yeah. So um, that was great. And the, the, I, I remember distinctly early on in the project after Eugene had passed saying and realizing everything in this book is about Eugene. It's not about me. Mm-hmm. It's not about Jeff. It's not about anybody Everything in this book is going to be about Eugene, mm-hmm. and that made it really easy because now I'm just I'm just putting the spotlight on what Eugene did and said and knew and taught because I knew it so well. And had you taken things also that had been already published and put in there as well? So in other words, some of his other favorite tricks from some of his books. No, uh, uh, our or you let them stand alone. Our principle really was it needed to be. There are a couple of exceptions, but the principle was it needed to have been unpublished. And what that meant is if it was in one of his previous books or on one of his DVDs Mm -hmm. or in a print magazine, that was considered published so hands off. Gotcha. Everything that's in those two books is was unpublished. He had intentionally decided not to put it on a DVD or in a print magazine or in a book. Some of them had been released. Uh, there are a couple of things that had been released as as marketed materials, but he had more work on them, and so we would share the instructions and add in his additional insights. Mm-hmm. But yes, yeah, so this really was mostly previously unpublished. But there were a, after he was gone, there were a few items that felt so important to include in these books. Just a handful. Was it like Table for Five, or what was? The- uh, well. A House with Many Rooms. Yes. The essay where Eugene talks about magic is a house with many rooms. That has been quoted and recorded on this podcast more than anything else. Yeah. It's such a beautiful insight. And I felt, um, and took it on myself as the you know primary author, to ask permission to reprint that in one of the books because that's a legacy essay, isn't it? Is. It? it is. Yeah. Yeah. So there were a few things in each book that I'd gotten permission to reprint, and everybody was so generous, mm-hmm. so supportive of this project. But 90% of both of these books are uh, previously unpublished tricks, routines, things he held had held back because they were so good. But he performed them in his professional acts. All the time. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, and those books are still available. I assume they, they have it sold out and you reprinted. Yeah, uh, they uh, they both have been reprinted, uh, but not changed. So yeah. they are the uh, primary edition. They are both still in print. Okay, first edition, second, third printing, basically. Yeah, first edition, second 
printing of both of the and books. the title of the books? The first one, he gave me the title. Huh. Uh, at first, Eugene thought there were going to be just one book, and then when I provided the list of all of the unpublished materials I had been keeping track of, yeah. he goes, oh, we have two books. <laughs> And then, without missing a beat, he gave me the title of each of them. He said, the first book will be called Eugene Berger From Beyond. Creepy. The second one will be called Eugene Berger Final Secrets. This is on, like, this is, like, 2010. Mm -hmm. Seven years from his death, he gave me the title of these two books, and that's what it was. So he wanted Eugene Berger From Beyond because, of course, he wanted people to have the experience of his spirit coming back to them after he had passed. Right. Is there a particular trick in one or the other, both of yours, of favorite? Well, he had favorites. I'm sure. And he told me, after he gave me the titles, he said, Larry, my spirit slates routine will be the last routine in From Beyond, and the trick that cannot be explained will be the last trick in Final Secrets. He gave me a lot of latitude about placing materials, building these books, but he wanted his incredible slate routine to anchor the first book and his incredible work on Vernon's trick to anchor the second book. I was going to talk about that for just a moment, and that is the trick that can't be explained. I understand that, and he had told me, he uh, was giving a lecture on that, but apparently he didn't do that a lot in the U.S. He had done it overseas, and I thought, what? This is, I think, first of all, the most incredible trick. Uh, For those who don't understand or have never heard of the trick that can't be explained, it is basically any card that is selected and the deck is shuffled and you tell them where the card is, essentially. Yeah. Is that good? Yeah. Uh, what, what, the way Eugene, it's presented in different ways. The way Eugene presented it is the, uh, the, the deck is borrowed, the audience participant shuffles, shuffles, shuffles the deck and selects a card fairly, freely. Freely. And after they have selected that card, it uh, is turned uh, it, everyone sees what it is, say the four of diamonds. Eugene would say, see the card box over there? Open it up and take what out. Uh, take out what's inside, and it would be the four of hearts. Mm-hmm. That was the primary way he did it. it it's essentially 52 outs. 52 outs, right. Mm-hmm. And psychological, verbal structures to guide the participant to select the card that he wa- the one card of 52 that he wants them to select. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. So it's not, I mean, even though it is random, is he kind of will funnel you or force you to get down to one he wants. In, in, in invisible not, ways, right. He will... Not he, to equivocate. Uh, well, yes, he would use equivocate. Uh, so he would come, there were, you know, multiple outs and kind of equivocate to get you to select a card and feel like you had freely selected it. Mm-hmm. He was mm-hmm. really good at making you feel like you just, you sure you don't want to change it. your mind. Yeah. Yeah. Psychological I'm- strategies, all kinds of devices, uh, it's slight free, by the way, slight free, Correct. Mm-hmm. uh, uh, psychological structures to get you to select the card he wanted you to. Right, but you may count down to the card, or again, a variety of methods to get to wherever the yeah. card would be. F- fully explained in Eugene Berger Final Secrets, every nook and cranny of that masterpiece. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and they can buy those both uh, online through? Uh, theory and Art of, uh, the address is theoryandartofmagic.com. Yep. TheoryandArtOfMagic.com. And for people who might be interested in wanting to sign up for a workshop and or the Magic and Mystery School, where do they go and I would say start sure with me. Um, start with me. Send me an email if you're interested, and I'll direct you. My email is Larry at Lawrence Haas. Dot com. That's H-A-S-S, one A, two S's, and I'll help you. You can also go to MagicalWisdom.com. That's the Mystery School's website. Uh, but, yeah, be in touch with me, and I can help you see what might be a, a good path for your magic education. Is there an age limit as far as the minimum and maximum? Yes, uh, that's a good question. So our online classes are open to anybody, Mm -hmm. you know, with a serious interest in magic. We don't do any age issues there. The master class, the live in-person classes in Las Vegas, we ask people to be a teenager or above. But we also have a minor policy. Mm -hmm. So if you're under the age of 18, you have to have parents come with you to make that trip to Las Vegas. I mean, they've got to, those those young people need to be safe. 
So it is possible to attend one of those classes if you're a, th- a teen, but um, but most of our participants are 18 and above. But they can be as as young as 13, or can they be yeah, 11? Yeah, they can be 13. Yeah, we don't. Uh, 11, 11 and 12 year olds, we don't have in our classes. 13 and up. Yeah. When people go for the week, by the way, do you? have places for them to stay or special hotel discounts or something? I I wish we did. What we do have is uh, we have certain places we recommend to people Mm -hmm. because we have found over time that they're good places to be, they're safe places to be, uh, they're conveniently located to Mm -hmm. food and restaurants. We are not able to get hotel discounts in Las Vegas, but uh, we help people figure out how to make choices about coming to stay there and have this experience with us. Gotcha. Abigail McBride is is uh, someone who does a lot of helping people figure out where to stay. So she coordinates. She's kind of their travel agent. If you do have an issue and you've never been to Vegas, then she will help you. Yeah, and I do too. People will contact me directly mm-hmm. and I will help. I will help the experience make sense for you. Wow. I should also mention that we have scholarships. In 2012, the Mystery School created a scholarship program where we receive donations from people in our worldwide community, and what they provide are need-based scholarships. We do not want financial need to be the barrier that keeps magicians from having their magic education. So very generous program. People donate to us so that we can give those dollars out to magicians who need a hand up. Not a hand out, a hand up. It's not charity. Nope. Uh, They've got to put in money toward their own experience. We do not cover that. It's Mm -hmm. not a free ride, but we absolutely help uh, pay most of the cost of tuition. Mm -hmm. So again, if you're interested in if, if you are a person who has a need at this particular time in your life, uh, you can go to MagicalWisdom.com and read about our scholarship program and how to apply. I would think it had been particularly difficult during the last couple of years of COVID in which people have been out of work, out of job, and they were looking for something and thinking, well, I wonder if I can make magic a full-time profession for me, but I really can't even afford to get to Vegas, let alone sign up for the Absolutely. School. And so what we did is we we – hived off a particular part of the scholarship fund to create stipends for people to attend online classes. Mm -hmm. So you can get assistance in attending one of our online classes because as you say, Scott, these have been tough years. Yes, they have. And so we haven't, we didn't have in-person classes for quite a while. Everything was online, but we still were giving out our resources to help people attend those classes. Uh, This is a really strong program for us that's important to our school to help people get their education. So, uh, you know, have a look at it and see what it's about. And uh, maybe you would be a good candidate for a scholarship or a stipend. That's great. Well, thanks very much, Larry. I appreciate your time and uh, getting to spend uh, with you and a little bit more deeper about some of these topics. It's always fun uh, getting to chat with uh, on the theoretical side a little bit. And so the name of my podcast is called The Magic Word Podcast. I always like to close to find out from my guests, what is your philosophy of life? Speaking my, of a philosopher, uh, I've never asked a philosopher. What a good <laughs> question. My philosophy of life is to follow your passions, everybody. Discover what you really love to do, your passion project in life, the thing that excites you and gets you out of bed every morning, and then figure out how to spend as much time as possible doing it. Because life will be good, and your life will be filled with joy if you can pursue your passions to the fullest ability. Wow. Well said. Thank you, Doctor. (laughs) Thank you, Scott. It's great to be with you. Really an honor, and I love talking with you. What a great session this has been. (laughs) So, for the Magic Word Podcast, that was Larry Haas. This is Scotty Out. Well, I don't know about you, but I think that's one I need to go back and listen to again and again. That was phenomenal. Thank you, Larry. That was just a great conversation. Always good catching up with you. And I'm sorry to the rest of the listeners that it's taken so long for me to present this to you. But I hope that you enjoyed that as much as me. Man, that was great. Thanks again. Well, uh, just a quick reminder to make sure you sign up for the pod letter. If you go to the com, there you will see a little pop up that will allow you to subscribe to our pod letter, which is a weekly thing. It just lets you know who is on from week to week and also some suggestions from the archives. 
if I mentioned the first of the program, if you cannot help us in some financial way, you can help us grow the podcast by giving us a five-star review and some nice comments on iTunes or whichever platform you use to listen to your podcast. That would be extremely helpful and help us to grow as well, because it seems like we've kind of reached that plateau, if you will. We've reached as many magicians as we possibly can who are interested in listening to the podcast. So if you can, tell your friends, tell people in your magic groups in your clubs uh, wherever that you congregate at conventions or whatever remind them on your social platforms they should be listening to the magic word podcast that will be helpful thank you guys and gals very much again for helping us so until next week stay well get booked and remember to discover what you really love to do and then figure out how to spend as much time as possible doing it this is scotty out Thank you.